Thank you, Bill. My name is Burkhard Ober. I work for Allianz Global Investors. I have uh, probably one comment and one question. Uh, one comment is uh, I work for Allianz Global Investors and my boss is an Egyptian, Mohammed Al Arian. Uh, I think the corporate sector should get much more involved in North Africa because there was one word that is missing in the debate, that is demography. If you look at the future of Europe, our aging society, average age in Germany is 43 years old. Where do our young people come from? They can only come from North Africa. I think North Africa is the future of us as corporate members and as corporate citizens. The future is south of the Mediterranean and we have to be very much aware of this. So I would really like to, to stress the point that German companies European companies have to look south. This is where probably our demographics will find a kind of solution. So there is hope. The other word that was missing, the word dem demography already mentioned, the other word that was missing, and I would like to put this question to Michelle, how do you see the involvement of Saudi Arabia in that region? Okay, well, why don't you... Go ahead with your question, and then we'll have time for the panelists to react to everything. Sure. Thank you. Vasya Stoilo from IFES. This question is for all of the panelists, but uh, in particular for Mr. Brock. Um, immediately after the Arab Spring uh, here in the U.S., there was a great emphasis on coordination of donor efforts. And my question is, looking at the transatlantic relationships, what sort of level of coordination there was between the various European agencies and transatlantic organizations, for example, such as the OSCE uh, with the EU and, of course, with their uh, U.S. counterparts. Thank you. Okay. Michelle, why don't we start with you? Okay. So uh, the involvement of Saudi Arabia in the region um, really is a conundrum now. Um, I, I mean, the, the uh, Saudi royal family uh, made not much of a secret of their unhappiness with what happened, particularly in Egypt. Uh, Libya, again, is a separate case, is a case apart. Uh, there, I think they were happy, you know, to see regime change because, of course, uh, Colonel Gaddafi had tried to assassinate the Saudi king. Um, and uh, talk about a fatal error. But anyway, um, they, they um, so they, there's, you know, a, seems to be a great deal of discomfort in Saudi Arabia with, go, with, with what's going on in the region. Uh, at the same time, they've made some generous aid pledges. And what's really unclear is exactly what are the conditions that, that came with these things. Uh, there was a Saudi effort. Of course, the, the Saudis gave uh, uh, refuge to President Ben Ali from Tunisia. There was a Saudi effort to prevent or discourage the prosecution of President Mubarak. That seems to have failed, although the actual prosecution hasn't be begun yet, and we don't know. But it, it, it seems to me that that will not be able to be avoided in, in Egypt. But uh, on the other hand, um, the, and, and officials from the transitional government in Egypt have been visiting Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. There could be uh, some sort of a, a bargain developing in which those new governments show some deference to Saudi strategic concerns, particularly regarding Iran, Bahrain, health happenings elsewhere in the, in the Gulf. Uh, I think it's really unclear what kind of a role Saudi Arabia is going to try to play inside countries like Egypt. There are many rumors, of course, of funding, funding Salafis and other Islamists and so forth. And um, I, I think this is an open question. To what extent Saudi Arabia is going to be interested in fostering stability in these countries by offering economic aid without without interfering in their internal politics uh, and just be willing to accept, say, their cooperation on strategic issues and be content with that versus whether we will see Saudi Arabia trying to manipulate internal politics. And another big question about this, I think, 
for the transatlantic community is to what extent can there be cooperation between the United States and Europe on one hand, Saudi Arabia, and other Gulf states. And of course, we can't lump them all together. You know, Qatar's agenda is going to be different from Saudi Arabia's. But uh, to what extent we can cooperate on, on fostering the development of this region, or are we going to be competitors for influence there? Well, sure, the corporate sector uh, should be involved, and uh, because uh, to create an atmosphere of investment there, it's an important question. Uh, we have some new with this pro uh, project, Desert Tech, which is solar energy in Northern Africa. I say, instead of giving the big subsidies in that, and every German farmhouse is uh, uh, solar energy installations, uh, has the only, it's a very good installation, but we have only one problem. There's not so much sun in Germany. And <laughs> I think it would be economically quite better to use that money to do it such places, in Greece or Northern Africa, for investments. Uh, and uh, because it has economically good for us and growth rates for the others, we need that on that broader perspective. And the other point is for sure the question of demographic factor and uh, uh, give uh, these young people their chance. There's a lot of discussion about the so-called rotation migration, rotating migration. I do not really believe in that until now. It is in, in, on paper a good idea that people go for two or three years to work to Europe, earn money, get higher qualifications, go back. But I fear if they are really good people, they decide to stay, and the employers will ask them to stay. And then the real good people are don't, do not go back to build their countries. Uh, so it's then not rotating migration, it's brain drain. And uh, here I have for myself uh, not a real answer, but uh, the question is really there. And here we have the need to talk also to the corporate sector on that. The question what the transatlantic community can do. First of all, that it's what my experience is Egypt, for example, do they want our open help? I know that a lot of forces in Egypt, for example, uh, do not like that they meet in public with us because of the image the West has, because of the Middle East conflict. They think it's a burden for them in a possible election. We have to take into our consideration how to deal with that to be helpful without bringing them disadvantages. And uh, here I think we have to see that. And the question is also, which role can play in that the transatlantic community together with Turkey, which could be a good example that a, a certain positive development is possible. But also here are certain limits, which uh, we do not know anymore because we have lost our understanding of history. Until the First World War, in the whole, North, nearly in the whole of North Africa, Turkey was a colonial power. Turkey is not an Arab country. It's considered as the old colonial power, which is sometimes forgotten. So there's all the certain limits of the credibility of Turkey. But on the other side, it's a good example because it's a relatively successful country, both in terms of economy, democracy, and the rule of law. Not our standards yet, but compared to that, incredibly successful. And uh, here we have to see that. I think what we have to do is that our foundations were closer together. We have in Germany, but also now setting up the European Union, political foundations, which are going to go with public money to possible partners mm -hmm. in that the democratic system, the socialists, the liberals, the conservatives, and so on. And here, I think, can be a cooperation uh, with foundations United States. What we should avoid, we were not always able to avoid that in Latin America and so on, we should not come to a way of competition in that question. And uh, some ideological foundations like to have this competition and that is not helpful. Uh, here I think uh, uh, we should consider that and uh, yeah, it must be included of certain British foundations to be uh, a little bit cautious, we'll say it that way. And uh, 
And uh, the other point is um, action observation, that it can be partly in this uh, private field, and here IF is going to play an important role, but it was mentioned for CD, for example. How can we able to have, with the experience of OSC, an election observation, a cooperation with the United States, uh, that uh, we can deliver an, uh, an credible observation missions? Uh, which are long-term observation missions. I do not believe in that missions we sent that sometimes three days before the elections look in 20 polling stations and they say it's a fair or not a fair elections. It's long-term. If it's in October elections, we have to start now, to bring new people now on the ground, uh, to how it's all prepared and so on. And uh, here I think perhaps uh, this can be also helpful uh, that we can set up such things more and faster. Thank you. I don't think there's much that I can add to this uh, discuss discussion. I would just add that from the perspective of a nonprofit organization, um, which th sees things in different perspective than perhaps the U.S. government or the EU, um, certainly uh, one of the most important things that we have noticed working in Egypt or Tunisia is the, necess the necessity of very strong coordination amongst all the players, NGOs, um, as well as transatlantic and multilateral organizations. Um, often there ends up being a bit of a confusion, I think, in the early days in Tunisia. Everybody ended up in Tunisia, and nobody quite knew what everybody else was doing. Um, you know, there needed to be large discussions, strategic planning meetings between the various organizations that were set up eventually uh, to avoid these kind of um, situations where there ends up being major donor fatigue as within the, for the stakeholders for whom we're trying to, to work. So I would just say that from our perspective, increased coordination is always welcome. Okay. First of all, let me ask all of you for a round of applause to thank our panelists for just a terrific presentation. We have had a presentation that is resulted in a literal smorgasbord of issues that we can spend hours and hours examining. Clearly what has been the result of the Arab Spring so far is that these very complex nationalistic societies have got very difficult and large challenges ahead of them. And it is our hopes as Americans and Europeans to work with them so that they can produce the constructive changes that will be credible and meaningful to their citizens and their countries. IFAS has been uh, delighted to be the sponsor of this. We are absolutely honored by the Transatlantic Policy Network to be included in this very important Transatlantic Week, which has been trying to bring thought leaders and policy leader leaders particularly from the European Parliament and the United States Congress and government together closer. This has resulted, this exercise over the last decade has resulted in, I think, a more meaningful business uh, corporate sector involvement in policy making, as well as exposing and allowing civil society, think tanks, foundations, and other observers of policy to have greater exchanges as the personalities and the people from the European Parliament and the American Congress become closer together by spending time together on issues of mutual concern. So first, let me thank once again the panelists for their contribution of time and more particularly their great contribution of thought to the discussions going forward. Let me thank all of you for being part of this discussion, particularly those on the web who have joined us. And finally, let me wish all of our friends from Europe safe travels home. Thank you.